in influenza pandemics in the past, there have been usually two or three waves. Uh, but th there's a difference uh, in the way that this, this virus is spread. <laughs> Dear friends, welcome to another edition of the Forum 2000 online chat, where we discuss the future of freedom and democracy in these complicated times. Today, uh, let me welcome with us a historian, author, and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution in the United States, Professor Niall Ferguson. Professor Ferguson, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm very delighted to be able to join. It's been too long since I've been in Prague and uh, Thanks to the pandemic, uh, it seems we can now have conversations via Zoom without needing to get on, on long haul flights. Uh, so this is one of the few silver linings of this great disaster. <laughs> uh, so Professor Ferguson, you have been um, actually quite critical of the, uh, of the handling by some Western governments of the COVID pandemic, essentially saying that they may have done uh, too much, too late, if I'm interpreting you correctly. Uh, is that still your view? Well, let me be clear. I started writing about this issue in January, warning not only my uh, readers, but uh, warning people in government in the UK and the US that a pandemic was rapidly approaching and that the clear lesson of history was early detection, early action. That, that's a quotation from the epidemiologist Larry Brilliant uh, were the right combination of policies. And I'm afraid the US and the UK uh, did neither. Uh, in fact, for most of January, February and the first half of March, governments uh, dithered around, public health bureaucracies did far too little, there was insufficient testing, there was uh, actually a very poor understanding of the nature of the, the virus and the disease. And then in mid-March, in a panic, uh, both governments read a report, a paper by another Neil Ferguson, not me, but the epidemiologist at Imperial College, uh, and decided that they would have to lock down economies to avoid enormous numbers of deaths. And this, I think, was uh, the worst of both worlds, because first of all, you left it too late uh, and didn't act when you could have done. And then you did something very extreme, uh, the blunt instruments of economic lockdowns. Uh, and that has caused enormous economic contractions in both countries without, I think, a very significant public health benefit. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that we've ended up with the worst of both worlds. And indeed, if I look around the United States, it's far from clear that the pandemic is, uh, is over. In fact, in the majority of states, uh, it seems as if the number of cases is still going up. So, uh, in, in, with this in mind, how, how do you think we should approach the second wave if it, if it arrives? Well, it may not be as simple as a second wave, uh, because uh, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, is not like an influenza virus. In influenza pandemics in the past, there have been usually two or three waves. Uh, but th there's a difference uh, in the way that this, this virus is spread. It's spread by super spreaders to a large extent. A relatively small proportion of people do most of the, the spreading. Uh, it's also a disease that is particularly uh, harmful to elderly people, uh, unlike influenza, which often uh, is just as likely to kill the very young as the very old. So th there's another scenario that I can think of here in which you simply get an ongoing wave. The, there's no sign of the wave cresting in the south of the United States, for example. It's just going on. So you might just have an ongoing wave in those parts of the world that fail to manage uh, the, the pandemic. Brazil's another example of this, where you just see an, a steady upward uh, slope in the number of, of cases. Finally, I think we should look on the bright side. It's possible that because of the way that it operates, the virus can actually die out relatively quickly if governments get the right policies in place. And that's why you see these very steep declines in some countries where they've managed to essentially break up the super spreader events, make those very difficult and protect those vulnerable parts of the population. So a, a second wave is only one of at least three scenarios that we have to contemplate, one of which is, is really quite a good scenario and one of which is a pretty bad one. <laughs> 
whatever whatever may be the the, the end of this or the uh, let's say the, the the scenario that we will be seeing. What, what do you think will be the longer term effect on the on the societies of of this shock that we have just experienced? Well, we know as historians that uh, pandemics can be very disruptive, uh, especially the very big ones. I, I don't think COVID nineteen is going to be as as destructive a pandemic as say the influenza of nineteen eighty nineteen. Uh, it, and, and in that sense, it's not likely to be one of the top 10 uh, pandemics in history. But even so, I think we can learn a, a certain amount from those other pandemics. Trust can be uh, reduced uh, uh, quite significantly by a contagious disease, especially one that's spread by asymptomatic people. Uh, so you, you could imagine that in some societies, there's actually quite a permanent consequence of social distancing, even after the virus has, has receded. In the United States, we're seeing that divisions, pre-existing divisions of class and, and race have been uh, widened or exacerbated by, by the impact of the virus. You know, Jakob, a lot depends on how long this lasts. Some people are acting as if it's over. I mean, I see all kinds of signs of relaxation and normalization around the world. And uh, in fact, you just described a, a kind of relaxation that's happening in, in Prague right now with less mask wearing and a kind of sense of return to normality. Uh, and, and in that kind of scenario, we, we might find that we revert quite quickly to normality and it doesn't have very lasting effects. But if, as we were saying a minute ago, it comes back, uh, or if it turns out to be very difficult to get a vaccine, or if it turns out that the thing actually does harm to younger people that we just hadn't really noticed, there are a whole bunch of reasons why we might actually have to resume social distancing. Uh, and I think there's a, an important lesson to be learned from the experience of HIV AIDS, because HIV AIDS uh, was uh, something that the, there never was a vaccine against, though there were some therapies. And sexual behavior changed. People began to do a great deal more safe sex with condoms, but they didn't radically and entirely change their behavior. Uh, there still was and still is unsafe sex. And there still are people each year who get infected with HIV. And indeed, the HIV pandemic has in fact lasted for three decades. Uh, I think we could say something similar might happen with COVID-19 only with social life being changed the way sexual life was changed by HIV AIDS. Not completely, because we just aren't capable of completely changing our behavior, but, but in some important and lasting ways. So I, I try, trying to think of this as a sort of analog with HIV is helpful. This, this is to social life what HIV was and is to sexual life. You're speaking about changes in, in behavior. I mean, we have been seeing a very dramatic or fairly dramatic change in behavior in, in most of our societies. We accepted uh, limitations that a couple of months ago would probably be in, in a, unimaginable in many Western countries. Uh, people stayed at home, you know, uh, there are different schemes for tracing what people are doing. Uh, do you think this will uh, have a longer term if, uh, impact on, on how our democracies work, how, how Western democracy operates? I think there's a danger that we can learn the, lo the wrong lessons from the events of the last uh, five or six months. The wrong lesson is that, uh, that China should be our role model, uh, that, that uh, we should learn from the way in which the Chinese controlled the pandemic, confining it to Hubei province with draconian measures, locking people in uh, apartment blocks, and then using all the tools of state surveillance uh, to uh, to try to control the spread of the virus subsequently. Uh, that's the wrong lesson. Number one, this pandemic originated in China's one-party state with all the pathologies that go with that system. Uh, we should have known much earlier than we did about the danger posed by the new coronavirus. Uh, we should have known really in December, and they should have limited travel from Wuhan uh, at the very beginning of January. So uh, this is in a very substantial measure, uh, a disaster made in China. Secondly, the, the, the right China to learn from is the Republic of China, Taiwan, which got the response exactly right. From the very get-go, even before the Chinese admitted there was a problem, Taiwan wrapped up testing and used contact tracing 
to limit the spread of the virus. And it did so very successfully so that deaths in Taiwan are in single digits, even though it's right next to China. And Taiwan's a great advertisement for the fact that a democracy can cope with the public health emergency without compromising individual freedom. Remember, contact tracing is, is designed uh, and, and well designed in the case of Taiwan to prevent super spreader events spreading the virus throughout the population. Sure, there's some risk to individual privacy uh, embedded in any contact tracing app, but the Taiwanese are very good at making sure that new technology doesn't undermine individual privacy. It's one of the reasons that Audrey Tang was brought into the government by President Tsai. I mean, Audrey was one of the cyberpunk libertarians uh, of just a few years ago. So Taiwan's a role model that we should all learn from, showing that uh, you can use uh, new technology uh, and social network tracing in order to limit a, a virus spread without undermining liberty. By contrast, measures adopted in countries like the UK and the US re restrict liberty far more. How can a libertarian complain about contact tracing if he or she has spent the last two months confined uh, to their home by government order? That's a far greater restriction of liberty than a contact tracing app would entail. Uh, let me follow up on your on your um, idea about Taiwan. I fully agree. Taiwan is is a place where we should look to and, and learn from. In many ways, uh, this is this is one 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 very good example: the, the handling of the pandemic. Uh, and yet, we see that uh, Taiwan is currently under significant pressure from China in terms of um, uh, participating in the WHO, but also there has been hints that. Uh, China is, is getting ready to maybe uh, be more forceful towards Taiwan. Uh, so uh, how do you see China's uh, sort of performance internationally? How do you think uh, China will come out of this in terms of a global, global power? Well, China's making a very big push to rewrite the narrative so that uh, its responsibility for the pandemic is downplayed. They've even been spreading fake news that the virus originated outside China. Uh, the Chinese have also been using uh, the, uh, the offers of, of aid and, and medical equipment to try to win friends and influence people around the world. And I hope that these efforts aren't, aren't too successful and that people see through what is a kind of a propaganda effort by Beijing uh, really to cover up its, its enormous responsibility for this disaster. China has been hit hard economically, uh, and despite the best efforts of the leadership, they are going to struggle to keep growth in positive territory this year. Uh, so they have their own internal problems, which I don't think we should underestimate. I think this has taken its toll on the credibility of Xi Jinping uh, as a leader, frankly. Uh, my worry is that China, because of these pressures, may take greater risks in its, uh, in its domestic and foreign policy. We've seen already the hurried way in which they're moving to impose uh, Beijing's authority on Hong Kong. Uh, you mentioned, and I think you're right to mention it, rumors of possible aggressive action towards uh, Taiwan. And there are also rumors of action in the South China Sea that one occasionally hears. Uh, the perception in Beijing, I think, and maybe also in Moscow, is that there's never going to be a better time to confront the United States geopolitically than the year 2020. The pandemic, the huge recession that has been caused by lockdowns, and an approaching presidential election all make it seem like the ideal year to, to take geopolitical risk. So I worry that they may be tempted to do that precisely because the United States seems to be in such disarray. But I'll, I'll add one final point. I think the pandemic has been a moment of truth for many people, especially in Europe. It's shone a very bright light on the realities of how the Chinese state works. Uh, and I think it's kind of brought people out of denial. Last year, back in February, I said, Cold War II's already begun, it's underway. And a lot of Europeans said, no, 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 how could you say such an inflammatory thing? I think they now realize, partly because of the impact of the pandemic, that Cold War II is happening and uh, that it's not going to be easy to be non-aligned in this new Cold War. So in this context, and that will be my, my uh, questioning conclusion, um, 
What would be your recommendation and maybe as a historian based on your knowledge of, of past pandemics and how societies have dealt with them, what would be your recommendation for the global democratic community and, and, and democracies around the world? Uh, what should they focus on now after the, after the pandemic is over? Well, I think there's obviously some radical overhaul required in the public health bureaucracies of some democracies, which have performed dismally. Uh, I think in the US and the UK particularly, hard questions have to be asked about what the relevant agencies were doing back in January, when I could see as a historian that there was a pandemic coming and they appear to have been asleep at the wheel. But I think there's a broader issue that all democracies have to grapple with and, and that is how far we can uh, prioritize the the different threats that we confront at the world economic forum in, in davos back in january all anybody talked about was climate change uh, it was the uh, top four global risks essentially that were discussed in the global risk report and the sessions were dominated by this issue uh, the presence of Greta Thunberg ensured that it really was the only topic of discussion. But you can't have only one risk that you worry about. It was absurd to be having conversations about climate change when a pandemic was obviously already underway uh, in East Asia. Uh, it's absurd to talk only about pandemics now when there are clearly other risks. We're still as much in danger from a nuclear war as we are from any other threat that uh, we face. So the lesson surely must be that we need a more sophisticated approach to risk management, to the big risks that we face, because they're multiple and, uh, and there can't be just one that we uh, obsess about. What I'd like to see is uh, an overhaul of the way in which nas national security is understood uh, so that uh, the people who lead our countries can get advice that effectively ranks and attaches probabilities to the various risks that we face, as well as noting the interconnections between them. Uh, it, it hasn't helped, I think, our ability to prepare for a disaster like this, that for the last couple of years, the only risk that anybody wanted to talk about at international conferences was climate change, which by comparison with a pandemic or a nuclear war is a pretty slow moving threat to humanity. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ferguson. It has been a pleasure speaking to you and I hope you remain safe and, and healthy and all the best. Thank you very much, Jakob. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.